What a privilege to be here. Thank you. East is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. Till. What comes after that till in Rudyard Kipling's well-known quote? Well, pondering that question has inspired so much of my life since I was a journalist in India in 1985-86. I was just out of college, and I had been given a scholarship to study freedom of the press in India. And I was also stringing for The Economist and some other news agencies. First, you should know, though, that India was not a happening place to go in the 1980s. This was the Reagan era. There were many of my college peers were heading on to Wall Street to work at places like Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or off to the great Northwest to make their millions at Microsoft. And I was definitely not seen as hip heading to South Asia. In addition, I came from this East Coast academic, political, ambitious family, a family that pretty much thought that anything below the chin really wasn't worth mentioning. <laughs> Linear thinking, in fact, was so highly valued in the world of my youth that when I first went to meet with a highly respected editor uh, of a national newspaper in New Delhi, he said to me, well, Mem Sabji, you must know that everything in India is both true and false at the same time. <laughs> well, I figured I landed on another planet. You know, that kind of ambiguity just didn't exist in the world I knew. On top of that, I was atheistic. I wasn't one of those cliched Western youth from in the 1960s and 70s who went to Asia to find themselves. Instead, spirituality was so out of my frame of reference that when a colleague in India mentioned to me that this guy, the Dalai Lama, was going to be in Bogaya, the place where the Buddha was said to be in, enlightened, and he was going to be performing this major Tibetan ceremony called the Kali Chakra, well, I kind of fumbled and said, now, remind me who the Dalai Lama is? <laughs> I had heard of him, but this was the 1980s, and you know he wasn't exactly a household name, certainly not in my household. But I was a journalist, and there was going to be a big crowd, so off I went. Well, when I arrived in Bogaya, a new acquaintance urged me to go hear a venerable teacher speak under the very Bodhi tree where the Buddha was said to have attained enlightenment. And I was always open to new experiences, you know, so I went to sit and meditate for my first time. Well, I wish I could say I was immediately struck by the power of this practice or had some extraordinary insight on this sacred spot. But mostly I remember just swatting at flies and trying to get comfortable because of this root sticking into my butt. And I really, I really don't remember much of anything the teacher said. I was, however, deeply impressed by the warmth and the wisdom that the Dalai Lama seemed to exude during the long hours of this many-day ceremony. And I was touched by the nuns and the monks who come great distances, who were serious and respectful, as, long as, be, as well as being lighthearted and generous. So when the Dalai Lama left Bogaya, I decided I would sit a 10-day silent meditation retreat. Now, mind you, this was strictly out of intellectual curiosity. I you know, went in Rome, you know, you do as the Romans do, right? Well, about four days into this retreat, after sitting and walking and sitting and walking and mostly listening to the chatter of my own mind, I made a discovery. To my surprise, and this truly was a surprise, I realized there was this whole non-linear world within me, this world of paradox and ambiguity and creative possibility and I, I never explored this. I was so astonished that I practically grabbed the teacher and said with sincere confusion, how can I be a journalist and meditate? <laughs> <laughs> My upbringing was such that these inner and outer worlds seemed completely disconnected. East and West couldn't possibly meet, or could they? Well, I had to find out, and this line of inquiry was also prompted by a series of unexpected encounters with a number of prominent spiritual leaders uh, from different tr uh, traditions. I not only met the Dalai Lama, but when Pope John Paul II was in Goa, a Western friend and I 
were ushered into the section where they had the people with leprosy and other diseases and disabilities. And it turned out that this was a very special section because we were all personally blessed by the Pope. I then went off to the Kumbh Mela, which is a major Hindu festival, that only largest of which happens every 12 years, and this was one of those years. And I went to hang out with some Hindu holy men, uh, along with hundreds of thousands of other pilgrims. In Delhi, I lived in a small room behind the home of two Sikh brothers and learned quite a bit about Sikhism. In Bombay, now known as Mumbai, I uh, stayed for some time with the head of the Theosophical Society and his family in the center where Krishnamurti was raised. And when I went to Calcutta to go volunteer at the home of the destitute and dying, well, who should appear on my very first day but Mother Teresa? <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I could go on. But long and short of it was, I, I may not have considered myself on some kind of spiritual path, but the universe seemed to have other ideas. And <laughs> it occurred to me that not only did I have to find out what this was all about, but I better find out. <laughs> on top of this, uh, during that same year in India, I went to the city of Bhopal. This was about 10 months after the tragic explosion of the Union Carbide plant, chemical plant, that immediately killed hundreds and hundreds of people and injured thousands and thousands more. And the horror of that just left an indelible mark on me. I realized in some ways for the first time the destructive potential of corporations, unbridled by worker safety obligations, unaccountable to their impact on human health and the environment. Not that Indian corporations are bastions of worker safety, but this particular meeting of East and West resulted not only in misunderstanding, but in death and disability that continues to have its ripple effects to this day. So when I returned to the United States, I was determined to explore this newly recognized inner world. I, I wanted to understand the intricacies of the mind. Why do we create these polarities in perception? Why do we uh, cling to this false sense of we're separate from others? Well, this meant instead of going on to graduate school in international relations, I became a cook and a housekeeper at the Insight Meditation Society, which is a major retreat center in Massachusetts. Well, as you can imagine, my family was not exactly thrilled about this choice. And there was a lot of hand-wringing and question-asking, things like, you know, she had so much potential. What happened? You know, how could she do this to us? In any case, I served on staff for a year and then sat a series of silent meditation retreats for about another year before going to graduate school in education with a focus on adolescent psychology. Now, these studies returned me to India where I researched the experience of teenage girls living on the borderline of cultures, meaning coming from traditional Indian homes, but exposed to Western values. How did Western culture change their lives? What was their sense of self relative to others? How did they hold the meeting of East and West? As you can tell, I was actually, under the guise of research, asking these girls the very same questions I was asking myself. As my quest deepened, it became clear that the seeming polarities between East and West were simply symptomatic of a deeper split that we often experience in many aspects of our lives, inner and outer, head and heart, mind and body, and beyond that between ourselves and other people and other species and ultimately between ourselves and the earth itself. That split couldn't have been made clearer than in Bhopal. How could heads of corporations have this horrific impact on a community and not seem to care? How could they hire lawyers for millions of dollars defending themselves against allegations of wrongdoing without compensating those they had clearly harmed. What began to emerge for me was an insight of interconnectedness and reciprocity. I realized how essential it is to cultivate 
a seamless understanding that inner and outer, head and heart, mind and body are all connected. And most important, that we and every other being and the planet itself are inextricably, fundamentally interconnected. If we don't do this work, and from my experience, it's a lifelong practice, then we will keep destroying that which, in essence, gives us life. Now, this may not seem like a profound realization to all of you. You know, this is Whidbey Island, after all. But remember, I was in my 20s, and I came from this head-dominated, disembodied, you know, East Coast world. And what, what came to me in response was a koan, that multifaceted, deep question that I began to ask myself over and over, and that's become the passion of so much of my work and life since that time. And that is, how can East and West meet? How can mind and body and heart and spirit work as one? How can I live in support of all life, reaching its fullest potential? This koan now expresses itself in my personal life as I raise a beautiful boy adopted from Nepal and in my professional life as I try to foster a deeper understanding that of the connection between our own health and the health of the planet. This has been through my 20 years of work in environmental health, first as a founding director of a private foundation which invested in environmental health projects. Then I founded a national nonprofit dedicated to children's environmental health and after 10 years, I merged that with Commonweal, which is a health and environmental research institute in Northern California, and became the director of one of Commonweal's major programs, the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. The Collaborative now has over 4,500 members in 79 countries in all 50 states. And I spend my days discussing the emerging science on toxic chemicals and other environmental contributors to chronic disease and disability. I speak with research scientists and health professionals and advocates, and we in turn collaborate to catalyze initiatives to translate that science in a stronger public health policy on the state, national, and international levels. Our motto? Our motto is science and civility. That means transcending that hardened, polarized thinking that often dominates our culture, and instead putting health and prevention and that understanding of that fundamental interconnectedness in the center of all our decision making. That means sitting down at the table with people of very different views and op listening with an open mind and genuine respect for that kernel of wisdom that may be trying to emerge. In essence, what underlies and animates my work and really all of my life is that east and west, head and heart, mind and body, all offer valuable lessons towards embodying what it means to live an integrated life. In fact, I think Roger Kipling came to the same conclusion when he wrote, and this is the last stanza of the, what I started with. There is neither east nor west, nor border, nor breed, nor birth, when two strong men, or women, of course, stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. If we can consciously practice while holding whatever seeming polarities and ambiguities seem to exist in our own, own lives with that kind of integrity, then I believe we have a chance at creating a world in which everyone and everything flourishes for generations to come. Thank you. <laughs>